The Vision 2020 Quality Schools in Every Neighborhood Local Control and Accountability Plan, or LCAP, opening uh, overview and comments. We, um, we do have a quorum with Trustee uh, Barrera, myself, and Trustee um, McQuarrie present. Um, we're going to begin. We've, we have a received communication that uh, John Evans is on his way. He'll be here about 1230, but we need to go ahead and get uh, for, move forward with the program. Oh, wonderful. All right. So uh, welcome, uh, President Whitehurst Payne. Uh, I'll hand out over the uh, beginning to you. I am sure that it is afternoon now, and good afternoon to all of you. Thank you for being here. Um, I did not use two wheels this time to get here, but uh, I am here. And good to get started. Uh, the board does not hear non-agenda public testimony at special meetings. Public testimony will be heard at each LCAP goal and at the end of the meeting. I believe we have two hours left at the end uh, to hear additional comments. I'd like to welcome you and to ask you to please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I would like to welcome everyone present today and call the June 12th, 2019 meeting to order. This is a special meeting. And do we have all board members here except uh, Dr. Evans, Dr. Evans is on his way. That's amazing. Both officers were late today. I apologize mm -hmm. uh, for uh, both of us being late today. Uh, I'd like a, a requ to request a motion to adopt the agenda. So moved. The motion was moved by Mr. Beiser and seconded by Mr. Barrera. And that, all in favor, you'll have to raise your hand. Aye. Okay, that passes 4 0. Thank you. And I already told you that we will not hear non agenda public testimony at this meeting today because it is a special meeting. And that means that we're only dealing with this particular agenda. Uh, the public testimony speakers are limited to a maximum of three minutes per speaker. And depending upon the total number of speaker requests received by the board, the time may be reduced to two or even one minute each. iPads are located at the back table. Uh, and that would be over here. So everybody knows where you can sign up to speak. Superintendent Martin, please begin the presentation. Thank you, President Whitehurst Payne. Um, as you said, this is our annual LCAP workshop, and we like to spend a whole day focusing on this with presentations throughout the day to have a more in-depth, robust discussion about the work in the LCAP. LCAP guides and drives all of the decisions of the district. As you know, July 1st, 2013, when the governor adopted the local control funding formula with the LCAP going with it, they said, look, with local control, there needs to be local accountability. And the LCAP is the accountability that goes with the funding formula. And so now we're five years into that work, and this particular LCAP that we're presenting today, we're in year three of a three-year LCAP cycle. 
So it's about deepening the work, strengthening the work, um, figuring out from using feedback in terms of data and metrics what has worked and what has not worked and how do we decide where we're going next. We have not changed our goals since the beginning. Number one goal in the LCAP is closing the achievement gap, which many districts will talk about the achievement gap, but we add to it with high expectations for all, and that's where most of our equity work lives in goal one and goal two. Well, actually, it lives across all of these goals, but when you commit to equity and excellence in closing the achievement gap, goal one, goal two is access to a broad and challenging curriculum. That happens when you have quality leadership, teaching, and learning throughout the district, and the context in which the work has to happen is in goal four, positive school environments, climates, and culture, and goal five is the family community engagement with highly regarded neighborhood schools, and all of that gets tied together under goal six with well-orchestrated district-wide support services and communications. So what today is about is going through all six of the LCAP goals. We don't have them in the exact order, one, two, three, four, five, six. We start with closing the achievement gap with high expectations for all, and then we'll, from there we'll move to goal four. Um, and then goal two, goal three, goal five, we have a break this evening at 5.30 to 6, and then this afternoon we're going to review the goals again, go through one through five, go through the goals and have um, public comment in the, in the later part of the evening. But we're going to begin this morning, not this morning, it just turned to this afternoon. <laughs> we'll begin this afternoon with the goal one, and in each of the, in, of the goal areas, there's certain areas that we're featuring and that we're lifting up and highlighting for the work coming ahead looking forward and we're starting with goal one looking at mathematics and grading we recently had a grading workshop we talked about we've talked about grading now we're speaking specifically about mathematics and grading and then we'll also be talking about students with disabilities as two feature areas on how we're planning to address um, goal one closing the achievement gap with high expectations for all so we have a team ready to present goal one, closing the achievement gap. I'll turn it over to Dr. Freire, our area superintendent. And if you can introduce our guest, Genevieve is obviously, but introduce our guest as well. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon to present uh, goal one to Superintendent Martin and the Board of Trustees. We'd like to start by introducing our partner in this work, Mr. Patrick Callahan, who's done um, extensive work in leading efforts to strengthen math instruction um, specifically with uh, San Francisco, but actually in other districts and in other countries as well. So we're uh, thankful that he's here to uh, present with us this afternoon. At the beginning of the school year, we launched a study of secondary mathematics. We set out to learn as much as possible and gather as much information to give us a clear idea of what the current status of math instruction was across our secondary schools. There was two key levers that maximized those efforts. The first lever is that we didn't do this work alone. Like I said, we partnered with someone that has expertise and has um, partnered with other districts to lead this work, and that was uh, Patrick Callahan. The other key lever was that we learned alongside our principals and our teachers. So this study wasn't something that we did in a vacuum and in, not in isolation, but we created opportunities where we could work with our leaders and our teachers to really study mathematics um, across the district. We also um, focused on um, looking at our data. And as we paint the picture of the current reality, we have to ensure that data is a part of that conversation. So what you have here is this slide that uh, looks at SBAC performance data over a four-year period starting in 2015. We look for trends in mathematics performance on the state assessment. These bar graphs reveal that in the past four years, the number of students meeting or exceeding standards remains relatively unchanged. There, there aren't any huge increases in our math performance. Because we're um, a district driven by equity, we always look at our student subgroups. We always look at how our historically underperforming students are doing. And this particular um, data point here, and it's not meant for you to actually see the, the numbers, but more the the trends in the sea of red because you can actually see that um, we have 
a list of all of our schools and all of our subgroups. And everywhere you see a red is where our students are um, not meeting standard. When you take a close look at what this means for our student subgroups, it's clear that our underperforming students, um, which include our um, foster youth, homeless, students with disabilities, English language learners, low income, African American, and our Latinx student, um, we ask ourselves, are these, are these actually achievement gaps, or is this more of an issue of an opportunity gap? Next, we look at the correlation between SBAC and grades. So as we continue to paint this picture of the current um, reality, we take a look, closer look into grades, and more specifically, the correlation between grades and performance on Smarter Balance. The story behind this slide is both of grade inflation and using grades as punishment. So the first set of bars represents middle school um, grade SBAC correlation for grades 6th through 8th grade. And let's look at the first bar specifically for A's. 24% of the students who earned an A in their class did not demonstrate mastery on the SBAC. If we look at the high school first bar graph, 36% um, of the students who earned an A in the course did not demonstrate mastery on the SBAC. Um, we can look at the um, other extreme of that. There are students who actually demonstrated um, proficiency on the SBAC but received an F in the class. And so that brings us to the conversation of really looking at um, proficiency-based grading and ensuring that it's aligned to mastery and mastery of standards. Mm -hmm. Now I'll turn it over to Genevieve who will talk more about um, our baseline assessment. Okay. There we go. Okay. So we saw this, we saw the data from a high level and we wanted to get proximate to the student experience. So what we did were three separate things. The first thing that we did was deliver and score nearly 14,000 baseline assessments um, with the help of Patrick and his team to students enrolled in any form of integrated math one or two. And this assessment checked for students' ability uh, to reason through a word problem based on a seventh grade math standard. Our purpose was to assess how well students could communicate their logic, understand the context of the problem, and solve the problem effectively. The graph shows that the percentage of students who could do any combination of those things. So one of the most important things to notice in this graph is that 58.5% of the students, which is represented in the red, couldn't do any of those things. The second thing to acknowledge is that only 4.8% of the students who completed the assessment didn't engage in any constructive way, which means that over 95% of the, of the students made a serious attempt. And the majority of the students enrolled in integrated math one and two could not demonstrate any level of proficiency with a seventh grade standard. The second thing that we did, um, again with the help of, of Dr. Callahan and his, and his team was complete a walkthrough of nearly every high school math classroom in the district with the site principal, Sofia Freire, and myself and executive director, Cheryl Hiblin, using a tool to assess how students were engaging with each other in the presence of rigorous mathematics. The observational data that we collected after visiting over 150 classrooms at all 16 comprehensive high schools reflected that the majority of classrooms across the district are primarily focused on procedural assignments in favor of rich tasks requiring students to make meaning of the math that they're experiencing. In other words, they didn't have an opportunity to talk about the logic they used to solve the problems because the problems were dominantly procedural in nature and they didn't invite discussion. The third thing that we did was conduct a math listening tour by facilitating a mathematics feedback session in each of the cluster meetings, as well as most of the district's advisory committees. Additionally, we provided a link to a digital survey that we posted on our website so families and community members could offer feedback if they were unable to attend one of the meetings. And if you, you I think you have a digital copy of this, but if you click on the, on the um, box to the left, you can see all of the feedback that we've recorded um, by cluster, by meeting, um, and then all of the participants that participated through the link as well. 
And next year, we're going to engage our st stakeholders in a similar process to order, um, in order to present the data that we collect around the strategic plan that we've created to change students' experience in the district. And I'm going to pass it over to Sophia. Back to Sophia. Our strategy, our strategy for strengthening secondary math instruction across the district had to be grounded in our current reality. And the current reality is what we've um, just presented. Um, and we needed to design a um, vision to reach, to reach us and get us to the goal we wanted to accomplish. We set out to co-construct a vision with, um, for math with our principals and our teacher leaders. We ensured that this vision was aligned to our LCAP. And so there's a couple of things that I wanted to highlight in our LCAP goal 2.19. Multi-year, multi-tiered, learning pipeline, writing in mathematics, reasoning, and arguments. And so with all of those key words identified, we uh, worked with, like I said, principals and teachers to develop the following mathematics vision. All students engage in rigorous and relevant mathematics to solve problems associated with personal, civic, and professional context and are able to effectively explain and communicate their reasoning in a to a variety of audiences. And that's the, that's the vision that we're going to set out to accomplish. In order to develop the learning pipeline that will enable us to actualize our vision, we set out to launch a comprehensive approach, um, one that is focused on four key pillars, assessment and grading, guaranteed viable curriculum, instructional routines, all supported by administrative leadership. And so those are the key things that um, our work is going to focus on in the coming year. So with that, we're excited to introduce this, this idea of enhanced mathematics. And let me tell you a little bit about what um, enhanced mathematics is. This course will be piloted at the sixth and ninth grade levels in high schools, middle schools and high schools across the district. This is not something that we are mandating. This is actually something that we've um, reached out to schools about and they have volunteered to participate and they have volunteered to pilot this course for us. And uh, here's what makes this course so powerful and game changing for our students. Um, so as you can see in the slide, it increases rigor. The curriculum is focused on application, authentic projects, communicating reasoning by having students write. The instruction will be focused on instructional routines. And um, we're going to focus on the student vital actions that are on an eight, five by eight card. And that's the card that was in an earlier slide. And that's the card that gave us all of our baseline data for our classroom observations. Assessment and grading will be a key component of enhanced math. We will teach the teachers who are piloting enhanced math to grade based on proficiency and assess for true mastery of content standards. And last but not certainly not least, we're going to ensure that um, our leaders, both principals and vice principals, have the tools and the training that they need to support the math teachers at their sites. So a little bit more about guaranteed um, viable curriculum. The curriculum, is being developed, the curriculum that's being developed goes beyond a year at a glance. It goes beyond a simple scope and sequence or units of study. The units that are being developed have daily lessons that teachers can use to teach this course. It's very um, specific. And it's not um, just something that um, gives them direction. It actually highlights how they will teach the lesson. So there will be um, units of study and lessons in the curriculum. In terms of instructional routines, uh, these are just to name a few some of the things that we'll be teaching teachers how to do, uh, ensuring that students have an opportunity for analysis, math talk, mathematical modeling, which is actually different than what I thought it was. Um, so we're all learning in this process, and um, 
It's not quite what you think it is just by reading the word mathematical modeling. Thank you, Dr. Callahan, for that. Three reads, uh, opportunities for students to clarify, critique, correct. And um, I'm not going to go through all of the lists, but we did want to give you an idea of what instructional routines we would be highlighting in enhanced <coughs> math. And um, finally, actually, this is not my slide, so I'm going to turn <laughs> it over to Dr. Um, Patrick Callahan to talk about grading and assessment. Thank you. So as part of this uh, plan and the pilot of the enhanced mathematics, one of the things that we focused on as a pillar is the assessment and grading. And one of the things we'll be focusing on is shifting grading towards what's called standards based or sometimes called proficiency or mastery grading. And uh, the idea here is that, and this quote says it well, standard based grading is about having concrete learning objectives and connecting them to evidence. And that'll be our guiding principle. Um, so the, uh, did I go twice? Yeah, go back. Sorry about that. There we go. So as part of the work that we'll be doing is um, doing assessment makeovers. As part of our study this year, we looked at lots of unit and final exams across the district. And um, honestly, uh, there was not a lack of coherence. There was differences within sites and across sites. And a lot of uh, lack of agreement about what was actually being assessed. So one of the first things we'll be doing is really looking at what's important and identifying the best way to assess those. Furthermore, um, we'll be putting into a place a, a benchmark, a district-wide benchmark that will be given twice a year for all middle school and high school. And this will be tied directly to the LCAP goals. Uh, as probably people remember, a lot of times mathematics is about calculation and numbers, and there's not always a, a space for writing and communicating reasoning. The purpose of these district benchmarks is to create uh, a coherent um, example of that to collect data across all of the sites. Uh, due to lack of time, we would normally have you participate, but we'll share an example that we did at the leadership lab with all of the principals. Um, you saw data er earlier about grades and about the sort of static nature of these and the lack of correlation between grades and performance. And so we did an exercise with about 80 principals and other leaders, uh, high school across the district. So I'm going to show you some scores and I want to give you a few seconds to sort of think about, given this information, what sort of grade would you give this student? And again, this is a sort of exercise. So. We gave five students, and we asked teachers, and, uh, math teachers, and principals and assistant principals on their own, using whatever they thought was fair, reasonable, any method, percentages, whatever score they want, or they could use if their school had policies. But I would like to give you just a minute to look at this list, and I'm going to focus on the one that caused the most controversy, and then share out what our um, principals and teachers and leaders actually came up with, and that's the middle student, Kathy. So the assumptions here, assume these are six quizzes or six unit, they're all the same, they're worth 10 points each, and this is the end of the uh, semester. What letter grade would you give this student? So, and we'll just focus on Kathy. So just take a minute and think to yourself. So now I'll show you the results. What's really quite remarkable is in the exact example we gave, we had a split between A's, B's, C's, D's, and F's. And in fact, if you can see the two, the purple and the blue that are both about 18 and a half, say 20%, so about one fifth of the uh, principals and leaders gave that student, Kathy, an F, and an equal number gave that student an A. And I think that this caused and provoked a lot of discussion. We can talk about grades and how important they are, and as you know, in high school, failing a class can have huge consequences in terms of graduation, access to college, et cetera. And I'm not saying who's right. Is it the A, the F, the C? The point of this is to highlight is not who's right and who's wrong in determining grade, but the lack of agreement. And part of the challenge going forward as a part of this initiative 
is that we need to reach some agreement about what we mean by successful in mathematics. So this slide highlights the uh, assessment and grading component or pillar of the enhanced initiative. You know, the problem is we have different views and purposes. I'm sorry, I advanced my slide. Um, <laughs> didn't help you, but here we go. The uh, different views on purpose and roles of grades, and there's a mix of content, process, you know, does homework count or not? What do you, uh, how do you handle retakes? All of those things make huge uh, differences. And so the enhanced mathematics will look at something that will be rigorous, valid, and transparent. We want grades to actually mean something. And not just as uh, for district data purposes, but mean something for students, mean something for teacher, and mean something for parents, administrators, and other stakeholders. So uh, we're drawing on extensive research on this work. Uh, this is uh, sometimes called standards based or grading for equity. The three sort of principles uh, that we're going into is essentially uh, focus on mathematical accuracy. There's something called the tyranny of the zero in a standard 90, 80, 70 percent grading system that we often use. A single zero can pretty much uh, uh, ruin your chances of success. And so we want to look at something that's actually math mathematically viable. Furthermore, bias resistance. Some schools put a lot of things, for example, uh, behaviors. Do you participate in class? Do you turn in assignments on time? Others don't include that. We need to come to some agreement about how we handle these. And then lastly, motivation. Are the grades and the grading system set up to uh, essentially enforce compliance or punish students that don't do what they're told? Or are they actually tied towards um, achievement in a way that students who maybe are struggling at the beginning of the year would be motivated to work harder and not instead the opposite and give up. Thank you. Go back to me. <laughs> okay, so the intent of this graphic is to show how students who engage in the enhanced mathematics sequence will have the same opportunity at the end of the sequence as those who engage in an accelerated math sequence. So the graphic does not show every option available to students for 2019, 2020. Um, and it's important to understand that we're not removing any options. Um, actually, it's the opposite. We're creating an additional one. So the reason we're creating this additional course sequence is to challenge the current belief system that the only way to ma make mathematics better or more rigorous is by accelerating, or in other words, covering the content more quickly or by skipping courses. This practice comes at the expense of real world applications, uh, communicating students or students' ability to communicate their reasoning both verbally and in writing. And students in the enhanced mathematics course sequence will experience these things without sacrificing rigor, and their teachers will understand um, how to use a standards based grading approach. So this slide presents our proposed timeline for developing, piloting, and revising courses within the San Diego Enhanced Mathematics Sequence, that SDEM stands for San Diego Enhanced Mathematics. Um, so during 1920 school year, uh, a total of eight integrated Math One teachers from Morris High School, Point Loma, Madison, and Claremont will be serving as the research team, team for the IM1 course, and seven Math Six teachers from Montgomery, Bell, Challenger, and Innovation Middle will be serving um, as the, was it, yeah, is that Barb? Barb. Barb, sorry, Barb. Will be serving as the research team for Math 6. These teams will pilot the course and provide critical feedback for revisions this year. And in the following years, we'll continue the model until the sequence is completely built out. And with that, yeah. So 6 would be Math 6, and 9 is grade 9, or I am 1. Yeah. And so we're developing in year one for 1920. We're piloting that year and that same year for the rest of the district. We're developing assessments. We're launching the benchmark assessments. We're um, um, offering the instructional routines or instructional strategies because it's just in pilot phase for 1920. And then the following year, we'll pilot 710. And then it'll be open access for district wide the following year. Does that, yeah? OK. So and with that, I think we're open for questions. We're a bit ahead of time, so we have some time. Okay, that's the first phase of it here. Uh, let's see. Are we hearing from uh, anybody at this point? You want to continue? 
No, you, okay. they can take uh, questions from you on this. Yeah, We're I, still within goal one. We're going to have a second part of goal one, closing the achievement gap is students with disabilities, but this is the end of the mathematics and grading portion of how we're focusing on closing the achievement gap if you have any questions for these presenters. Yeah, I just have a couple quick questions. I'd like to go back to slide seven where uh, it's showing the proficiency rates, but they still got an F in the class. And, or they got an A in the class, but then they failed the state assessment. Mm -hmm. Is this the or one you're talking about? Slide seven, yeah. I've oh, got it. This is the one. Mm -hmm. So uh, the reason why I wanted to talk about this one just and, and ask a question is because I think there's a real disconnect and I think it speaks to a lot of the grading for learning, mm -hmm. grading for mastery concepts, the idea of allowing students the opportunity that if they uh, get an F on a, a test or assessment at the beginning of the year or beginning of the semester, maybe they learn that content a couple months later mm -hmm. and it's too late because they already got an F on the test, but now they know it. Mm -hmm. And so if they're given the opportunity to retake that assessment, they would be able to demonstrate mastery and receive an appropriate grade. And I think mm -hmm. that speaks to the people that got an F, but then demonstrated mastery on the state uh, exam. Mm -hmm. So that's the first uh, issue. The second thing, and I know that this is an anomaly, but sometimes uh, there may be a student with an F that somehow figures out how to beat the system and get a proficient score on the state assessment. And so those individuals need to be, um, you know, looked at with a little bit of scrutiny. I know in my years of experience, there ha that has been the case on a couple of situations where a student does not demonstrate the ability to do anything, but then somehow they're proficient on the state test. And so then, you know, we, upon further examination and maybe them sitting down with an administrator trying to ask them questions to see if they can explain any content or concept, to determine whether or not there was any impropriety. And on a couple of cases in my years of experience, they finally have admitted to cheating on the state assessment somehow. And so we need to make sure that we are not just blaming the teacher all the time, that sometimes students are, are doing things that are skewing uh, this kind of result, re, uh, result. But I believe that that is by far the exception and not the rule, because my experience uh, goes back to speaking about Kathy with the, and that's on slide 19, mm -hmm. um, you know, where you go into, uh, you know, that, that idea of grading for learning, one, zero, zero, 10, 10, 10. Mm -hmm. there, the question, I believe that, that we are asking or we asked the administrators the wrong question. The question isn't what grade would you give, the, because that always depends there's a lot more information that's missing. Mm -hmm. First, was, uh, was um, Kathy given the opportunity to retake quiz one, two, and three? Are these the retake grades? Second, was the content spiraled? Meaning, did quiz number four have half of the questions from quiz one, two, and three? And did quiz five? have half of those questions from quiz one, two, three, four, so on. And that's spiraling because then if uh, maybe Kathy didn't understand the concept in the first three weeks, but in week five, four, five, and six, maybe questions from quiz one, two, and three were put in. And that's another, uh, that leads me to my third one, because in there are a lot of math teachers that spiral with their assessments, does the teacher or it, it depends would a low score or two low scores be dropped? Mm -hmm. And if you drop a lower uh, one or two low assessment scores in an environment where they're spiraling and in an environment where students are given the opportunity to retake assessments to demonstrate mastery, um, then you'd have a very different outcome. And then the fourth question that it depends is, are we using the American grading system or the Canadian grading system? And this is articulating Ken O'Connor's grading for learning. In Canada, 80% to 100% is an A. And back when grades were being formulated, it is, it is mentioned, I've heard, uh, that the United States had to beat Canada. So we changed our standard from 80% to 100% for being an A. We had to beat those Canucks. Mm -hmm. So they changed it to 90% or above. Why? 
And so that speaks, I think, to the overall concept of assessment. How do we assess? How do we allow students the opportunity to uh, reassess after they've learned the content? I can't tell you how many students over the years, finally, when, you're, when we're doing our annual review for the final exam, finally concepts that mm -hmm. they did not understand at the beginning of the year, now they get it. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's about. It's not about did they get it at the end of that unit, that time stamp, because everybody learns at different rates. And so I think that's really exciting uh, that our the district is doing a very deep dive into this. I'm really uh, hopeful. Um, but my last question or comment brief, is because somebody else would like to come. My on. last question or comment is about the schools that volunteered mm -hmm. to do a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Was did the administrator volunteer? Did the teachers vote to volunteer? Mm -hmm. Were, was there a consensus with all the teachers in those math departments that they all know the workload that is ahead of them to redesign every assessment, every lesson, everything? So that, because we don't want to voluntold people. Right. Right. We want genuine buy-in on right. the process. And then also, uh, I know that money is tight, but what kind of additional compensation are those teachers in those departments going to be given for doing all this extra work? Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. do, do you want to respond to that? Or? So just a quick response to the points you raised about grading and the it depends. 100% in agreement. That's why we believe that if we don't have those conversations uh, collectively, then we continue to go down every one of those uh, um, possibilities. And it leads to a lot of confusion. So uh, we too are excited about taking this uh, chance to go into a deep dive, look at the research, and come to a common agreement. Because teachers and administrators shouldn't have to figure this out, every one of them on their own in a silo. Mm -hmm. And to address your question about um, how they were selected, they were not. They they volunteered and and every applied. applied they applied. So every um, teacher that was interested in the initiative came to a single day where we um, spelled out exactly what was happening, what our vision was for it, and if they were interested in applying to be part of the research team or the pilot, they applied for that. So it was individual teachers that are applied in a part yes. of the process instead of the whole department that's at a right. particular school. Absolutely. Okay, yes. that's, that's a big correct. difference. Yes. Thanks. Mr. Rivera. So, I appreciate what you've laid out. Uh, the data is a thing. Uh, sure. Just the fact that the data is a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and the data is a Yeah, is, is, is sobering as well. And it's also sobering, quite frankly, your um, chart about the uh, differences in the way that uh, people would look at right. grading Kathy. Um, so I think what I'm interested in is I, I understand the concept of, or at a basic level, the concept of enhanced mathematics. and. And you're trying to get at these sort of four, you know, um, key areas: the assessment, the curriculum, teaching, and district support. Um, I'm, what I'm a little bit wondering is: Are we? I'm, I'm not. A, I'm not questioning the value of enhanced mathematics and you know the strategy of piloting. I think what I'm asking is: What else are we doing? Because if what we're doing is throwing all our eggs in that one basket around one pilot, um, it calls to question, well, what have we been doing you know, for the past five years? And what are we doing to get to those four key areas in addition to the piloting and the taking to scale of enhanced mathematics? Because it feels like the challenge is bigger than the one solution around enhanced mathematics, or do you see enhanced mathematics as really the, the core you know, to get at uh, all of these areas? I can, I can respond to that. Um, high school principals and many middle school principals have highlighted strengthening math instruction as a key focus area within their strategic plans. 
So area superintendents are working with principals to help principals actualize those plans. Now, what does that necessarily look like? Well, it looks like ensuring that principals have the professional development opportunities that they need to strengthen their own instructional lens around mathematics instruction. And we actually did that all year long with our high school leaders. Um, it also looks like ensuring that site visits are focused on math instruction. So all of most of my um, visits this year have been in math classrooms. I feel like that um, has been good and bad. Uh, good because I have a narrow focus and I feel like I know the math department capacity of all of our high schools. Um, bad only because I haven't spent a lot of time in, in other classrooms. So there's a lot being done beyond this course that's just going to touch our ninth and uh, sixth and ninth graders next year. There are more efforts to strengthen um, instructional leadership, both by teachers and principals, in the coming year. Um, one of the things that we talked about are the instructional routines by, in the five by eight card is something that everyone can do, right? So you don't need to be piloting the course. You don't need to be part of the research right. te team yeah. to start incorporating the, the strategies in that um, five by eight card one thing. And the next thing that we're doing is we are now going to have benchmark assessments that we, um, of course, are not mandating, but we're strongly encouraging. So we will have, um, by the end of next year, district-wide data on how students are performing in a performance-based assessment that they'll be taking twice a year. And that will happen in all of our math classrooms at the middle school level and the high school level. Thanks. I hope that answers your question. Yes. Thank you. Um, Dr. McFerrin. Just press it. I should know where that is. <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for your presentation. And Patrick, welcome to the, to the group. Please, thank you. very happy you're here. Uh, we want to bring in outside expertise to give us an understanding about what we are doing, what can we do, and how do we get from where we are to where we want to be. And, and so your, your presence is very welcome. Um, I want to call attention to some of the uh, same similar slides that were already mentioned. Um, for example, slides five through seven, I believe, highlight the issues which you, you pointed out, and, and it's our promise, and, and it gives us uh, directions for looking at the future. What it also does, it points out, you know, the uh, some I think some opportunities for identifying best practices. Mm -hmm. So as I looked at. Uh, this slide seven, I believe it is, mm -hmm. with the subgroups, um, which has the, the matrix. Mm -hmm. uh, if we look at the state average versus the district average, uh, we're basically district is doing better than the state on almost all categories. Yeah. Oh, Michael, I hate to interrupt you. I saw that, and I, I want us to get away from that because the state is so low. Mm -hmm. It's okay. unacceptable for state. I mean, it, it's just it's not even worth comparing ourselves to. It's so frustrating. I know what you're saying, and yes, we are above, but if you're at 20% and we're at 22, that's horrendous. I absolutely recognize. I know the state has a long way to go. We do as well. But within this grid, there are some highlights. I only wanted to present that as sort of a kickoff point. As we looked at some of the other schools, if we look at some of their, their scores, and yes, we can do uh, much better. If we look at some of the groups, some of our schools are showing outcomes that are twice the state average. There are some highlights within our system that I think we can take a look at. And if we take a look at those highlighted uh, schools within these categories to find out what they are doing and see what are their best practices and what can be um, can, uh, incorporated into, the, uh, in, into our effort uh, go, moving forward. So yes, there are lots of things we can do, especially mathematics. And, and three of us are math teachers. so. I am a middle school math teacher, uh, so we have Kevin as well, and, and Sharon is also a math teacher, so we basically understand the task that's ahead of us. Uh, but I wanted to highlight that there are some things in here that we want to uh, point out, and I think there's some best practices that we're doing in, in some of these schools that are doing significantly better uh, than, uh, than, than others. But in addition, I think you've already pointed out the importance of the, uh, our grading system versus the, the, the SBACs. And, and, and the fact that, uh, um, that we have comparability, um, there's no change. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and our, our 
of students who would expect to get uh, some students would expect to, uh, they get A's in some category uh, within a teacher uh, within grades are failing when it comes to the uh, to our, to our state assessments and and the other way around. So I want to make sure we take a look at where we're we doing, what are we doing about that? And my sense is that that's the alignment effort. Mm -hmm. The alignment effort is also not just about the outcome. I think the alignment really is about the process, and that's what I saw in in your, your uh, middle slides in 9 through 11 about what we can do in order to bring about better alignment, take a look at our instructional practices, take a look at how we do staff development and training, um, and then uh, then the process for, for moving forward, moving from a pilot through multiple districts. So it looks like within four years, we'll have every grade um, on, uh, on, on uh, at least the middle school through the, uh, through the high school uh, on track. The other point I wanted to make on the, the chart that compares sixth grade with six through eight and uh, uh, grade, grade 11, we seem to be just locked in. There is no improvement on those students uh, who are uh, not only getting uh, lower grades as according to teachers, but they're also getting lower scores as according to our state assessments. And it tells me that this middle school grades are really so critical. Mm -hmm. I think it's been research shows that this is that they're it's the gatekeeper. Uh, if we can get our students through those middle grades to, to better understand what mathematics is all about, how to use it, make it more relevant, or make it more meaningful to them, uh, then we can move those those students. I think will then do much better as we go in into this more higher order thinking skills and and higher uh, demanding. Uh, um, mathematical uh, uh, concepts. So, so I, my sense is it's those middle schools that we need to really focus on in order to move us uh, forward. The other one is the, uh, the final sense of slides in terms of what do we need to do in order to um, improve uh, mathematics is working with our teachers and get a common agreement in a sense about what are we looking for, how are we doing it, how do we get there, and then to agree on a, on, on a grading uh, that will better match what students are doing It'll be performance-based, it'll be outcome-based, data-based, and then our, our outcomes as uh, demonstrated by state uh, assessments um, and our graduation rate will improve as a result. Thank you. Michael, I'm sorry, I apologize for that because I'm a little off schedule here with the way we've structured it. Um, we needed to do mathematics and grading, but the superintendent felt that we needed to just get some questions that you may have had in your mind out. We need to do students with disabilities, mm -hmm. a little bit of time left. and then have, <laughs> and then have uh, at one o'clock public testimony followed by our comments at one o five. Uh, in closing this section, although we'll come back to it afterwards if we have any time, it's like for me, hair is on fire. This is a red flag for all of us. And as a math teacher and someone who's worked in this arena, this, this is right up there. As you said, this is troubling. This is something we have to get on uh, immediately. And we'll come back to that. But right now, let's move quickly on to students with disabilities. Thank and you. thank you all for what you've done. You're thank not you. going to leave us, right? No. You're just going to, OK. <laughs> OK. Uh, students with disabilities, that team, please. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sarah Oz, the Executive Director of Special Ed. Are your mics on? Yeah, hello, thank you. Maybe we can get closer. <laughs> Put them a little closer to you. Oh, we can pull it, okay. We, ex we are excited to be here today to discuss our vision and plan. Oh, wait. Let's get us where we're the right slide. All right. So, um, so let me start up. We're excited to be here to discuss our vision and plan for supporting students with disabilities. When reflecting on the progress the district has made in supporting access for students with disabilities, we like to look back at historical perspective. 
Historically, many subgroups have experienced segregation in educational environments. In 1970, United States schools educated only one in five children with disabilities, and many states had laws excluding certain students. 1970. Today, since that time, there's been revisions to the law of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, and we have increased access and outcomes for children with disabilities in public school settings. Specifically, in San Diego Unified, we have worked diligently to provide students with disabilities the same opportunities and access as their non-disabled peers. Currently, we have 67% of our students in general education, 80% or more of their day. As we continue to welcome, value, and empower all students, including students with disabilities in our schools, we will continue to re reinforce the belief system that all students belong, are wanted, and feel successful. Although we did see small improvements for students with disability, based on smarter balance assessments in ELA and math, and graduation rates in 2018, there is still a significant achievement gap when compared to their non-disabled peers. We also want to take a look at percentage of students with disability in our district overall as, uh, and, and as grade level. So as you can see, overall it's 13.59%, which we've talked about before. But we also wanted to break it at a grade level so that we can get information about referral rates and trends when each grade level. And this will help us target improvements. This leads us to our vision for our work, which is all schools will recognize that students with disabilities are general education students first. And they will create a culture of belonging for them by providing educational access and meaningful opportunities equal to those of their non-disabled peers. So although in, we've had new law around that, it's still ongoing that we're continuing to work on access and mix of and opportunities, and also in, within that access, success. Throughout our district, we've been working on the ideal state for students. Through learning about high reliability schools with a focus on safe, collaborative, inclusive cultures that have strong tier one instructions designed with all learners and learning styles in mind, and a guaranteed and viable curriculum that all students have access to. As we inspire students, students also inspire us. This is a quote from one of our students in our deaf and hard of hearing program at Madison. When he was asked about what his wishes for the deaf and hard of hearing program were, he wished that there was deaf and hard of, program, hard of hearing program resources at all high schools, that some of the students have to travel very far to get the resources at Madison. So he uses this quote to encourage his peers to overcome those challenges. Tough times never last, but tough, tough people always do. And this is, was inspired by a book by Robert Schuller. To launch our work for next year, we're starting with a three-day summer institute that all principals, vice principals, and coaches from the central office are invited to. Our objective of this three-day institute is to widen the sphere of success to deepen the learning for all of our students by designing environments and instruction that meet the needs of our students to understand and leverage the strength of our students to enhance tier one instruction, to recognize the different models and benefits of co-teaching, to support students with intense needs at their home school, and to build leadership expectations for supporting students with disabilities. We have enlisted two consultants, um, Dr. Jackie Thousand, who's a professor emerita at California State University in San Marcos, and Dr. Rich Vila, who's an author and educational consultant. We have also chosen Lighthouse schools that will become model schools to demonstrate a culture focused on access and opportunities for all students by working with our consultants, special ed coaches, student-centered coaching cycles, so that they can become high reliability schools. And these are the schools per area. We have three elementary schools, two middle and one high to start, and then we'll continue to add Lighthouse Schools as we progress.
We also want to develop integrated student success teams at each school. Our vision is that over a three-year time period, school sites will build highly qualified integrated teams who work to discuss students that are currently outside the sphere of success. They will problem solve, design reading and social emotional interventions, implement interventions, monitor, and revise as needed to integrate students back into the sphere of success. We believe in our district if we develop a single coherent process to problem solve interventions and support to bring students into the sphere of success, if we provide learning experiences for all staff, if we provide professional development to em emphasize how children, adolescents, and adults learn, and if we provide intensive interventions around reading, social, emotional, and cognitive development at the early age possible, then we will engage more students within the sphere of success. We will have thorough referrals for special education. We'll have fewer students placed in specialized settings. And we will decrease the number of student behavioral referrals within the instructional day. Now I'm going to hand it over to Andrea Vincent to talk about coaching and support. Yes. Hi. Um, in order to support the implementation of this work, we have created a central office capacity building team comprised of six program managers and 12 resource teachers that are assigned to each area, acting in partnership with our area superintendents. The focus of our work includes strengthening three areas related to special education. These three areas are the writing and implementing of high quality individual education plans, designing effective service delivery models, teaching quality instructional practices. In addition, our capacity building teams will also be partnering in the existing student center coaching cycles focused in English language arts and math. The purpose of this partnership is to provide a lens into how to support students with disabilities by strengthening tier one instruction, providing collaboration on lesson design with universal design principles in mind. Additionally, we will model the effective co-teaching practices that are being taught at the Summer Institute. In order to ensure that our students with disabilities have access to a meaningful course of study, there will be collaboration and partnership with Instructional Cabinet and our Community Advisory Committee members. Through this collective effort, our vision is that in our mild mo students in our mild moderate program are enrolled in courses that lead to an A through G diploma. In order to accomplish this, we want to help the sites develop some uh, continuum of service options, and some of the examples are listed on the slide. Um, this includes the interventions that are systematic, target, targeted, and data-driven. We want to ensure that if students are being pulled out for specialized or related services, that they are not removed from core instruction in the general education environment. We'd like to create and strengthen quality support classes at secondary level. We'd like to continue to explore CT options and pathways to ensure access for our students that are interested in those areas. We have options for credit recovery. We want to ensure that all students have access to those. And we are also providing master schedule guidelines for leaders. We also want to ensure that students who are in our moderate to severe program also have access to courses that they would like to take and are not segregated from learning opportunities. Um, professional development is an instrumental in implementing our vision. We will continue to offer opportunities for the principals, teachers, and paraprofessionals and how to support our students with disabilities. This includes district level trainings as well as customized site-based trainings and coaching. Currently, we have trainings and topics such as curriculum implementation, strategies to support challenging behavior, universal design for learning methods, writing high quality individual education plans. And in the coming year, we are adding topics such as leading difficult conversations and teaching with high impact strategies. We also have exciting news about hiring a um, coordinator that will have many duties, one of which is to lead the development of the paraprofessional trainings and to design new offerings. So there are different ways to monitor the success of our outcomes. Uh, area superintendents, chief of staff, and executive director of special education will be conducting frequent site walkthroughs with a focus on the experiences of our students with disabilities. 
Area superintendents and program managers will continue to partner to support school sites within their area. Our capacity building teams will develop a summary of their work at each site to understand next steps. Additionally, we will continue to monitor the California dashboard data. So in closing, we believe that this collective effort and efficacy will lead to the improved outcomes for our students with disabilities and enable us to move forward in our vision of success and access for all. Thank you. Thank you. That was on speed dial. I Very good. Thank you. Uh, do we have any uh, public testimony here? Yes, we have one speaker on goal one, Moira Albritton. Okay. Good afternoon. I wanted to provide some input based on um, the CAC's most recent public meeting. Um, first, just to reiterate that students with disabilities need, deserve, desperately need um, actual curriculum, whether they're mild, moderate, moderate, severe, um, to reflect conversation at IEP tables rarely gets right now to how are we going to close the gap we really don't have that conversation built into our IEP meetings. I think that's something to consider. Um, the committee would like more accountability and oversight for each category of students with disabilities. Right now, we don't know which programs are effective. We don't know which students are succeeding. We don't have metrics. Um, all students with disabilities are obviously not the same. And we need the data to know how we are addressing all different subgroup constituents. Currently, um, it feel, we often also hear that students in the same school get similar IEP offers, um, too little individualization, um, and so I wanted to make sure that those were all brought forward. Um, I have a broader concern about the math presentation, um, and this, I think, goes for both students with disabilities and students who are English learners. Um, I just want to kind of broach the issue that if you have a language disability or if you are an English learner, that as we are making increased rigor in our math, that you're, you're, it's going to put students who have those kind of language impairments at a disadvantage. And so as we're increasing that language demand in math, I'm not arguing that it's not necessary, but I hope we're also going to give corresponding attention to our English language instruction. And I wanted to just clarify a couple more things. One, on slide six, not one high school south of I-8 had other than 0.0, .0 students with disabilities proficient in math in 11th grade. And that saddens my heart. Um, and then finally, I want to just clarify that quality support classes, um, the presentation I just saw for the first time, um, is not a new word for applied. Thank you. And that, that closes that segment of uh, public testimony, and we'll get back to board discussion. Uh, Dr. Evans, you just came in. Yes. Um, first of all, I heard the entire math presentation on my, on my phone in the car. So, wow. so um, and, and I, I just want to comment on that. I think the important thing there, it has to do with, we're talking about math, but I think just in general, it's a, a district-wide cultural issue in terms of grading. For learning, of course, that sounds good. I'm completely in favor of that. But there are a large segment of our population who very much for the last centuries has believed in grading for classification. That the purpose of grading is to categorize our students, to put them into boxes, and you know, you try to go from this box to that box. So I mean it's a big it's gonna be a big cultural challenge for people to realize we're not just classifying students, we're actually trying to get students to, to mastery. And just to show my own bias on the, the student that you talked about, Kathy, who had it. I'm assuming it's a big assumption that the, the, great, the tests were cumulative building blocks in math so that, that that's what happens each step along the way. And so therefore, I would have given her an A. Um, the student who had a, above her who had a six at the end, uh, but had done be better most of the, during most of the course, I would have had her retake a similar test just to make sure that it was actually an actual assessment. And the one who pretty consistently had low grades across, I would give them an incomplete. 
So that's just, I know that there has to be a big discussion among everybody, but I think that's the big issue about grading for learning. And in terms of the, the presentation we just had, I mean, one of the things that, that I'm most excited about is the integrated student success teams. I mean, are we really sitting down as a classroom, as a, as a grade level, as a school, and saying, these are the students who are having problems academically, behaviorally, whatever it is, and, and what are we going to do about it? Again, not just classifying them as, as being lower performers, but what are we going to do? And, and I'm sure there's, there's a big relationship that in terms of referrals for special education because it's, I just imagine the teacher would be so easy to say, you know, this is just, it's really difficult with this child. I think we need to make a special ed referral as opposed to what can we do to help them. So I think that's really great. Thanks. I'm going to make my comments about math before we move on to hear from the other board members about uh, special education. Uh, on Saturday, was it just with this past Saturday, superintendent and I attended a DEET mm -hmm. event in the community and someone, uh, a former parent from La Jolla High, was very concerned about uh, math overall and nationwide what we're doing with math and how we're teaching it. We've got to get it right for all of our kids. We, she said that in their uh, WASP accreditation that only one sixth of the kids passed uh, math at La Jolla High School. I told her to send me those data because I, I don't believe that. But uh, the point of the matter is that we must get it right for all of our students wherever they are. Uh, I appreciate Maura's comment about the students south of eight and their math scores. That's why I say it's unacceptable. We, we've got to crank it up a little bit. You know, we can't, I heard Rich's comment, we can't just do a little pilot with four or five kids when we've got literally thousands of kids who are depending upon us. And the fact of the matter is, I said it before in this room, I believe, the nation is depending upon us to get it right. It's, it's about national security and us getting it right with our kids. So I, I feel some urgency uh, about this whole issue of, of math and what's happening with that. Yes, we, Richard, I mean, we know about math because we've taught it, we've been in the classroom, et cetera, but we've got to move forward with that. And as far as special ed, I, I'm not going to criticize too much today because at least we're making progress. We're having that summer institute this summer. So now, Richard, and then we'll go around. Yeah, I think this is probably going to be kind of a running comment that I'll likely make with all the presentations. Um, but so the superintendent began by pointing out that we're in the third year of an LCAP cycle. So and, and I, I don't believe that this is what you were doing in this presentation, but what I think wouldn't really feel right is in any um, area if we were presenting, I, I very much appreciate the, um, the honesty and the transparency about data. Um, but I think what wouldn't feel right is we've got challenges that the data reveals and therefore here's the laundry list of new things that we're going to do. I think what we have to be looking at is what have our strategies been? What strategies do we believe have been most effective and why? And what's the data to support that analysis? And therefore, you know, in the way that the superintendent laid it out, how are we deepening and broadening those strategies that we feel have been most effective? Uh, and when we're identifying new strategies, um, you know, how are they um, uh, complementing the ongoing work, you know, that, that we've been doing. So that, again, you know, it's kind of similar to what I asked about the math presentation, but you know, it's the same. And I'm not asking to answer all that right now. I'm just saying in the way that we kind of lay out, um, you know, where we are in our, in our LCAP, I think that would be useful to, to look at. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Beiser. Yeah, um, I, I want to kind of piggyback on uh, what was brought up earlier, that we have a lot of schools with special ed at 0% um, in, in the 11th grade in a number of schools. And then our lighthouse uh, that we've chosen, I believe, was Claremont, 
And I noticed there's seven, seven high schools with a lower uh, special education performance rate. Um, you know, why, what was the reason behind picking Claremont? Why didn't we pick one of these five high schools with zero uh, percent in, in uh, special education? Did anybody speak to how we chose Claremont and why not another school that is obviously in more need? The, the criteria for choosing Lighthouse Schools was around um, uh, kind of similar to what we are sharing before, volunteer, wanting to go through the training, wanting to be part of that process um, from a principal's perspective and staff perspective. And also, um, was we already were seeing um, highlights that we can capitalize so that when schools who were struggling come in, that it is a true model of things to see. A lot of times people say, okay, show me where it's happening. Show me where kids yeah. are being successful. Show me how I can do that um, to feel like that it, that it can occur and that kids can be successful with these different challenges. I'm glad that you brought that up. Show me where it is occurring. Um, I'm just wondering if anybody off the top of their head might know, is there a school in San Diego Unified or anywhere in the county but if you're at 20 percent and we're at 22 that's horrendous i absolutely recognize i know the state has a long way to go we do as well but within this grid there are some highlights i only wanted to present that as sort of a kickoff point as we looked at some of the other schools if we look at some of their their scores and yes we can do uh, much better if we look at some of the groups some of our schools are showing outcomes that are twice the state average there are some highlights within our system that I think we can take a look at. And if we take a look at those highlighted uh, schools within these categories to find out what they are doing and see what are their best practices and what can be um, can, uh, incorporated into, the, uh, in, into our effort uh, go, moving forward. So yes, there are lots of things we can do, especially mathematics. And, and three of us are math teachers. So I am a middle school math teacher, uh, so we have Kevin as well. And, and Sharon is also a math teacher, so we basically understand the task that's ahead of us. Uh, but I wanted to highlight that there are some things in here that we want to uh, point out, and I think there's some best practices that we're doing in, in some of these schools that are doing significantly better uh, than, uh, than, than others. But in addition, I think you've already pointed out the importance of the, uh, our grading system versus the, the, the SBACs. And, and, and the fact that uh, um, that we have comparability, um, there's no change. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and our, our uh, students who would expect to get, uh, some students would expect to, they get A's in some category, uh, within a teacher, uh, within grades, are failing when it comes to, the, uh, to, our, to our state assessments and, and the other way around. So I want to make sure we take a look at where are we doing what are we doing about that? And my sense is that that's the alignment effort. Mm -hmm. The alignment effort is also not just about the outcome. I think the alignment really is about the process. And that's what I saw in, in your, your uh, middle slides in 9 through 11 about what we can do in order to bring about better alignment, take a look at our instructional practices, take a look at how we do staff development and training, um, and then, uh, then the process for, for moving forward, moving from a pilot through multiple districts, so it looks like within four years we'll have every grade um, on uh, on on uh, at least the middle school through the uh, through the high school uh, on track. The other point I wanted to make on the the chart that compares sixth grade with six through eight and uh, uh, grade grade eleven, we seem to be just locked in. There is no improvement on those students. Uh, who are uh, not only getting uh, lower grades as a, according to teachers, but they're also getting lower scores as according to our state assessments. And it tells me that this middle school grades are really so critical. Mm -hmm. I think it's been research shows that this is that they're, it's the gatekeeper. Uh, if we can get our students through those middle grades to, to better understand what mathematics is all about, how to use it, make it more relevant, uh, make it more meaningful to them. Uh, then we can move those, those students, I think, will then do much better as we go in, into this more higher order thinking skills and, and higher uh, demanding uh, uh, mathematical uh, uh, concepts. So, so I, my sense is it's those middle schools that we need to really focus on in order to move us uh, forward. The other one is the, uh, the final sense of slides in terms of 
what do we need to do in order to um, improve uh, mathematics is working with our teachers and get a common agreement in a sense about what are we looking for, how are we doing it, how do we get there, and then to agree on a, on, on a grading uh, that will better match what students are doing. It will be performance-based, it will be outcome-based, data-based, and then our, our outcomes as uh, demonstrated by state uh, assessments um, and our graduation rate will improve as a result. Thank you. Michael, I'm sorry. I apologize for that because I'm a little off schedule here with the way we've structured it. Um, we needed to do mathematics and grading, but the superintendent felt that we needed to just get some questions that you may have had in your mind out. We need to do students with disabilities and then have and then have uh, at 1 o'clock public testimony followed by our comments at 105. Uh, in closing this section, although we'll come back to it afterwards if we have any time, it's like for me, hair is on fire. This is a red flag for all of us. And as a math teacher and someone who's worked in this arena, this, this is right up there. As you said, this is troubling. This is something we have to get on. Uh, immediately and we'll come back to that but right now let's move quickly on to students with disabilities thank and you. thank you all for what you've done you're thank not you. going to leave us right no. you're just going to okay <laughs> okay uh, students with disabilities that team please thank you Hi, I'm Sarah Oz, the Executive Director of Special Ed. Are your mics on? Yeah, hello, thank you. Maybe we get closer. <laughs> Put them a little closer to you. Oh, we can pull it, okay. We, ex we are excited to be here today to discuss our vision and plan. Oh, wait. Let's get us where we're the right slide. All right. Um, so let me start. Up. We're excited to be here to discuss our vision and plan for supporting students with disabilities. When reflecting on the progress the district has made in supporting access for students with disabilities, we like to look back at historical perspective. Historically, many subgroups have experienced segregation in educational environments. In 1970, United States schools educated only one in five children with disabilities, and many states had laws excluding certain students, 1970. Today, since that time, there's been revisions to the law of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, and we have increased access and outcomes for children with disabilities in public school settings. Specifically, in San Diego Unified, we have worked diligently to provide students with disabilities the same opportunities and access as their non-disabled peers. Currently, we have 67% of our students in general education, 80% or more of their day. As we continue to welcome, value, and empower all students, including students with disabilities in our schools, we will continue to re reinforce the belief system that all students belong are wanted and feel successful. Although we did see small improvements for students with disability based on smarter balance assessments in ELA and math and graduation rates in 2018, there is still a significant achievement gap when compared to their non-disabled peers. We also want to take a look at percentage of students with disability in our district overall as uh, and, and as grade level. So as you can see, overall it's 13.59%, which we've talked about before. But we also wanted to break it up as grade level so that we can get information about referral rates and trends when each grade level. And this will help us target improvements. This leads us to our vision for our work, which is all schools will recognize that students with disabilities are general education students first. And they will create a culture of belonging for them by providing educational access and meaningful opportunities equal to those of their non-disabled peers. 
So although and we've had new law around that, it's still ongoing that we're continuing to work on access and, access and opportunities and also in, within that access, success. Throughout our district, we've been working on the ideal state for students. Through learning about high reliability schools with a focus on safe, collaborative, inclusive cultures that have strong tier one instructions designed with all learners and learning styles in mind, and a guaranteed and viable curriculum that all students have access to. As we inspire students, students also inspire us. This is a quote from one of our students in our deaf and hard of hearing program at Madison. When he was asked about what his wishes for the deaf and hard of hearing program were, he wished that there was deaf and hard of, program, hard of hearing program resources at all high schools, that some of the students have to travel very far to get the resources at Madison. So he uses this quote to encourage his peers to overcome those challenges. Tough times never last, but tough people always do. And this is, was inspired by a book by Robert Schuller. To launch our work for next year, we're starting with a three-day summer institute that all principals, vice principals, and coaches from the central office are invited to. Our objective of this three-day institute is to widen the sphere of success to deepen the learning for all of our students by designing environments and instruction that meet the needs of our students to understand and leverage the strength of our students to enhance tier one instruction, to recognize the different models and benefits of co-teaching, to support students with intense needs at their home school, and to build leadership expectations for supporting students with disabilities. We have enlisted two consultants, um, Dr. Jackie Thousen, who's a professor emerita at California State University in San Marcos, and Dr. Rich Vila, who's an author and educational consultant. We have also chosen Lighthouse schools that will become model schools to demonstrate a culture focused on access and opportunities for all students by working with our consultants, special ed coaches, student-centered coaching cycles, so that they can become high reliability schools. And these are the schools per area. We have three elementary schools, two middle and one high to start and then we'll continue to add Lighthouse Schools as we progress. We also want to develop integrated student success teams at each school. Our vision is that over a three year time period, school sites will build highly qualified integrated teams who work to discuss students that are currently outside the sphere of success. They will problem solve, design, reading, and social emotional interventions, implement interventions, monitor, and revise as needed to integrate students back into the sphere of success. We believe in our district if we develop a single coherent process to problem solve interventions and support to bring students into the sphere of success, if we provide learning experiences for all staff, if we provide professional development to em emphasize how children, adolescent, and adults learn, and if we provide intensive interventions around reading, social, emotional, and cognitive development at the early age possible, then we will engage more students within the sphere of success. We will have thorough refer referrals for special education. We'll have fewer students placed in specialized settings. And we will decrease the number of student behavioral referrals within the instructional day. Now I'm going to hand it over to Andrea Vincent to talk about coaching and support. Hi. Um, in order to support the implementation of this work, we have created a central office capacity building team comprised of six program managers and 12 resource teachers that are assigned to each area, acting in partnership with our area superintendents. The focus of our work includes strengthening three areas related to special education. These three areas are the writing and implementing of high quality individual education plans, designing effective service delivery models, teaching quality instructional practices. In addition, our capacity building teams will also be partnering in the existing student center coaching cycles focused in English language arts and math. The purpose of this partnership is to provide a lens into how to support students with disabilities by strengthening tier one instruction, providing collaboration on lesson design, 
with universal design principles in mind. Additionally, we will model the effective co-teaching practices that are being taught at the Summer Institute. In order to ensure that our students with disabilities have access to a meaningful course of study, there will be collaboration and partnership with Instructional Cabinet and our Community Advisory Committee members. Through this collective effort, our vision is that in our mild, students in our mild moderate program are enrolled in courses that lead to an A through G diploma. In order to accomplish this, we want to help the sites develop some uh, continuum of service options, and some of the examples are listed on the slide. Um, this includes the interventions that are systematic, target, targeted, and data-driven. We want to ensure that if students are being pulled out for specialized or related services, that they are not removed from core instruction in the general education environment. We'd like to create and strengthen quality support classes at secondary level. We'd like to continue to explore CT options and pathways to ensure access for our students that are interested in those areas. We have options for credit recovery. We want to ensure that all students have access to those. And we are also providing master schedule guidelines for leaders. We also want to ensure that students who are in our moderate to severe program also have access to courses that they would like to take and are not segregated from learning opportunities. Um, professional development is an instrumental in implementing our vision. We will continue to offer opportunities for the principals, teachers, and paraprofessionals and how to support our students with disabilities. This includes district level trainings as well as customized site-based trainings and coaching. Currently, we have trainings and topics such as curriculum implementation, strategies to support challenging behavior, universal design for learning methods, writing high quality individual education plans. And in the coming year, we are adding topics such as leading difficult conversations and teaching with high impact strategies. We also have exciting news about hiring a um, coordinator that will have many duties, one of which is to lead the development of the paraprofessional trainings and to design new offerings. So there are different ways to monitor the success of our outcomes. Uh, area superintendents, chief of staff, and executive director of special education will be conducting frequent site walkthroughs with a focus on the experiences of our students with disabilities. Area superintendents and program managers will continue to partner to support school sites within their area. Our capacity building teams will develop a summary of their work at each site to understand next steps. Additionally, we will continue to monitor the California dashboard data. So in closing, we believe that this collective effort and efficacy will lead to the improved outcomes for our students with disabilities and enable us to move forward in our vision of success and access for all. Thank you. Thank you. That was on speed dial. I Very know. good. Thank you. Uh, do we have any uh, public testimony here? Yes, we have one speaker on goal one, Moira Albritton. Okay. Good afternoon. I wanted to provide some input based on um, the CAC's most recent public meeting. Um, first, just to reiterate that students with disabilities need, deserve, desperately need um, actual curriculum, whether they're mild, moderate, moderate, severe, um, to reflect conversation at IEP tables rarely gets right now to how are we going to close the gap we really don't have that conversation built into our IEP meetings. I think that's something to consider. Um, the committee would like more accountability and oversight for each category of students with disabilities. Right now, we don't know which programs are effective. We don't know which students are succeeding. We don't have metrics. Um, all students with disabilities are obviously not the same. And we need the data to know how we are addressing all different subgroup constituents. Currently, um, it feel, we often also hear that students in the same school get similar IEP offers. Um, too little individualization 
um, and so I wanted to make sure that those were all brought forward. Um, I have a broader concern about the math presentation, um, and this I think goes for both students with disabilities and students who are English learners. Um, I just want to kind of broach the issue that if you have a language disability or if you are an English learner, that as we are making increased rigor in our math, that you're, you're, it's going to put students who have those kind of language impairments at a disadvantage. And so as we're increasing that language demand in math, I'm not arguing that it's not necessary, but I hope we're also going to give corresponding attention to our English language instruction. And I wanted to just clarify a couple more things. One on slide six, not one high school south of I-8 had other than 0.0, .0 students with disabilities proficient in math in 11th grade. And that saddens my heart. Um, and then finally, I want to just clarify that quality support classes, um, the presentation I just saw for the first time, um, is not a new word for applied. Thank you. And that, that closes that segment of uh, public testimony, and we'll get back to board discussion. Uh, Dr. Evans, you just came in. Yes. Um, first of all, I heard the entire math presentation on my, on my phone in the car. So, wow. so um, and, and I, I just want to comment on that. I think the important thing there, it has to do with, we're talking about math, but I think just in general, it's a, a district-wide cultural issue in terms of grading for learning, of course that sounds good, I'm completely in favor of that, but there are a large segment of our population who very much for the last centuries has believed in grading for classification. That the purpose of grading is to categorize our students, to put them into boxes, and you know, try to go from this box to that box. So I mean, it's a big, it's gonna be a big cultural challenge for people to realize we're not just classifying students, we're actually trying to get students to, to mastery. And just to show my own bias on the, the student that you talked about, Kathy, who had it. I'm assuming, it's a big assumption, that the, the, grade, the tests were cumulative building blocks in math so that, that that's what happens each step along the way. And so, therefore, I would have given her an A. Um, the student who had a, above her who had a six at the end, uh, but had done be better most of the, during most of the course, I would have had her retake a similar test just to make sure that it was actually an actual assessment. And the one who pretty consistently had low grades across, I would give them an incomplete. So that's just, I know that there has to be a big discussion among everybody, but I think that's the big issue about grading for learning. And in terms of the, the presentation we just had, I mean, one of the things that, that I'm most excited about is the integrated student success teams. I mean, are we really sitting down as a classroom, as a as a grade level, as a school, and saying these are the students who are having problems academically, behaviorally, whatever it is, and, and what are we going to do about it? Again, not just classifying them as, as being lower performers, but what are we going to do? And, and I'm sure there's, there's a big relationship that in terms of referrals for special education because it's, I just imagine the teacher would be so easy to say, you know, this is just, it's really difficult with this child. I think we need to make a special ed referral as opposed to what can we do to help them. So I think that's really great. Thanks. I'm going to make my comments about math before we move on to hear from the other board members about uh, special education. Uh, on Saturday, what was it just with this past Saturday, Superintendent and I attended a deep mm -hmm. event in the community and someone, uh, a former parent from La Jolla High, was very concerned about uh, math overall and nationwide what we're doing with math and how we're teaching it. We've got to get it right for all of our kids. We, she said that in their uh, WASP accreditation that only one-sixth of the kids passed uh, math at La Jolla High School. I told her to send me those data because I, I don't believe that. But uh, the point of the matter is that we must get it right for all of our students, wherever they are. Uh, I appreciate Maura's comment about the students south of eight and their math scores. That's why I say it's unacceptable. We, we've got to crank it up a little bit. You know, we can't, I heard Rich's comment, we can't just do a little pilot with four or five kids when we've got literally thousands of kids who are depending upon us. And the fact of the matter is, I said it before in this room, I believe, the nation is depending upon us to get it right. 
it, it's, it's about national security and us getting it right with our kids. So I, I feel some urgency uh, about this whole issue of, of math and what's happening with that. Yes, we, Richard, I mean, we know about math because we've taught it, we've been in the classroom, et cetera, but we've got to move forward with that. And as far as special ed, I, I'm not going to criticize too much today because at least we're making progress. We're having that summer institute this summer. So now, Richard, and then we'll go around. Yeah, I think this is probably going to be kind of a running comment that I'll likely make with all the presentations. Um, but so the superintendent began by pointing out that we're in the third year of an LCAP cycle. So, and, and I, I don't believe that this is what you were doing in this presentation, but what I think wouldn't really feel right is in any um, area, if we were presenting, I, I very much appreciate the, um, the honesty and the transparency about data. Um, but I think what wouldn't feel right is we've got challenges that the data reveals, and therefore, here's the laundry list of new things that we're going to do. I think what we have to be looking at is what have our strategies been? What strategies do we believe have been most effective and why? And what's the data to support that analysis? And therefore, you know, in the way that the superintendent laid it out, how are we deepening and broadening those strategies that we feel have been most effective? Uh, and when we're identifying new strategies, um, you know, how are they um, uh, complementing the ongoing work, you know, that, that we've been doing. So that, again, I, you know, it's kind of similar to what I asked about the math presentation, but, you know, same. And I'm not asking to answer all that right now. I'm just saying in the way that we kind of lay out, um, you know, where we are in our, in our LCAP, I think that would be useful to, to look at. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Beiser. Yeah, um, I, I want to kind of piggyback on uh, what was brought up earlier, that we have a lot of schools with special ed at 0% um, in, in the 11th grade in a number of schools. And then our lighthouse uh, that we've chosen, I believe, was Claremont. And I noticed there's seven, seven high schools with a lower uh, special education performance rate um, you know, why, what was the reason behind picking Claremont? Why didn't we pick one of these five high schools with zero uh, percent in, in uh, special education? Did anybody speak to how we chose Claremont and why not another school that is obviously in more need? Sure. The, the criteria for choosing Lighthouse schools was around um, uh, kind of similar to what we were sharing before, volunteer, wanting to go through the training, wanting to be part of that process um, from a principal's perspective and staff perspective. And also, um, was we already were seeing um, highlights that we can capitalize so that when schools who are struggling come in, that it is a true model of things to see. A lot of times people say, okay, show me where it's happening. Show me where kids yeah. are being successful. Show me how I can do that, um, to feel like that it, that it can occur and that kids can be successful with these different challenges. I'm glad that you brought that up. Show me where it is occurring. Um, I'm just wondering if anybody off the top of their head might know, is there a school in San Diego Unified or anywhere in the county, uh, well, going back to math, is there a school, middle school or high school, in San Diego Unified or anywhere in the county that has shown dramatic improvement in the state uh, mandated st testing, like over 10% the last two years in a row or anything like that? We've started. We've started to look at that um, data. I don't know that we're uh, prepared to say which schools at this point, but we yeah, Castle um, Park Middle School. Yeah, similarly, <laughs> we're, we're looking at which twenty-two percent growth the last two years. Yeah, might want to find out what did that school do. I'll tell you what they did. They threw away the district textbook. They went to the five main content standards, and they rebuilt and redesigned the entire curriculum around those content standards. They revised and rebuilt the entire, all the assessments based around those five content standards, standards based. Dr. Mike. Sure. 
Yeah, another district did something similar to that in San Francisco, uh, where they uh, they redesigned their curriculum and and um, readjusted how, how math was taught. I don't know we're, we're taking a look at that. Um, look, what I hear you saying is that we're we're making that effort to to create the opportunities and to provide students with access. Then have have the plan, and then I heard the reference to the IEP making sure that we have an IEP that truly addresses the needs of the student, but also uh, addresses the importance and the urgency for closing that gap. So it's, it's those quality IEPs, I think, that are essential. And I know we were at a, uh, um, um, four years ago, is it a uh, Panasonic uh, workshop where we focused on special education and what do we need to do in special education to make a difference. And a lot of that was making the adjustments that have already been made uh, including um, more tier one, more integration, uh, more rigorous uh, standards, as well as um, creating opportunities for access. In addition, it was writing high quality IEPs that address the needs of students. And I'm thinking in general, as we're working with our students, if we can identify the needs of all of our students, not only IEPs for our special ed students, let's have an instructional plan for each individual child so that we can track every child and I think we can identify their needs and I know the superintendent has, has uses the phrase know students by name and by need and I think we, if we can do that in mathematics uh, with all of our students we'll address that effort and move our students um, forward together. And, and, and one more point, um, here again I want to go back to this page seven just to make sure we're highlighting some of the areas where we're doing extremely well and I know we have a, a lot to do but in the area on mathematics or 11th grade for students with disabilities, our averages are, we're doing better uh, in a number of areas and significantly better in, in some of our schools. And I want to make sure that we're taking a look at those that are scoring, where our special ed students are twice uh, the state average, twice the district average. And that's at Kearney, uh, the DMD, uh, and La Jolla, um, and, uh, and at uh, uh, Scripps, I believe. So there are things that we are doing in our district and we're doing them well. And I want to make sure we're identifying those, highlighting those, and looking for best practices that we can uh, rise up and duplicate and expand. I wanted to make sure the connection was clear. Dr. Callahan did the work in San Francisco that you were just uh, mentioning. <laughs> That's where he's from. <laughs> I guess. I'm impressive. Thank you. Yeah. Did you want to respond? Yeah. I, I just, well, one, to be fair, there's a lot of people that did work in San Francisco. Yeah. I would not take credit <laughs> in any stretch of the imagination, but it was a um, it was a big project. It took uh, four years, overhauled the curriculum, overhauled instruction, looked at pathways. One thing I just wanted to add to this conversation that connects both presentations that, and it was honestly, I think a surprise to all of us, is that <clears throat> when you put instructional routines in place that focused on supporting all students at language and in language and mathematics in particular, the group, the subgroup that had the highest gains over the past four years was special ed. Mm -hmm. um, and so with those successes, we're building off that to try to build in those very same routines um, because the comment about if you're going to increase the um, uh, language demands mm -hmm. in mathematics, then you better have supports for every single student. And so, uh, as uh, Sophia pointed out in her slides, when she talked about instructional routines, we're using a lot of language routines um, that are researched from uh, Stanford's uh, Scale Institute. And these, I think, are really what make a huge difference. Combine a rigorous curriculum and add those specialized routines, and then you get successes for every student. And that is why I was so interested in, in our district getting some training in special education because a lot of the routines you even put in for special education work for other kids. It's good teaching. Absolutely. It's really good teaching. And all, I mean, I was a high school math teacher at one point and I know how arrogant teachers can be. I know my stuff and on and on and on. But you need some strategies if you can break it down for all the kids then it's not only the special ed kids will benefit, but some of the others. So I'm excited about that. And hopefully we'll see some results. And hopefully you guys will bring us back next year with some 
um, discussion on it so that it's not just a one shot for us, but we can move forward on that. Yeah. Thank you all for Thank that you. presentation Thank and for your comments. Thank you. Thank you.